doing a great job. We saw each other at the dinner for um, Chris Report, the 100 year old son. So we're going to make flowers. Yeah. Kind of an anxious young man. So Polly Scott, thank you, sir. Would you be kind enough to give the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah, sure. Well, give me a second. Welcome. We don't have the whole church filled like we used to, but we got more room. I'm going to ask our past president, Kurt Gibson, to begin this evening with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now I'll go over to you. I'm going to go sit down. Go sit down. Have a seat. Relax. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first meeting, I think, in, what, two years? It's uh, somewhat awkward, but uh, we used to fill this whole place. And John, thank you for coming. We appreciate that. Uh, I think we're going to start off with you and let you start your speech. And then in the meantime, it'll, it'll fill in. And then I'll add some things from that as we go forward. I'm sorry? I, I was going to introduce John briefly. Um, well, come on up here and introduce him then. He's been practicing his introduction for four months, and I want to make sure he gets oh, it right. Oh, oh. Um, no, sorry, I didn't practice. <laughs> so I'm going to be a little bit rusty. I, thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Kirk, as well, our former president and current president. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, for being here. Just briefly, a little bit of uh, in the way of uh, notes. Um, Next month, just so you know, uh, before I talk about John, uh, we have uh, a film we're going to show here about Bill Benelli, who was a former speaker here, a B-17 pilot from, uh, flying uh, from Italy, about 30 missions. And before that, he was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He was a mechanic during Pearl Harbor. He survived the bombing and strafing. And uh, then a B-17 combat pilot. Uh, um, so he passed away last year, unfortunately. He did speak for us before, and he was here several times. But uh, we have a nice tribute film that was made for him by his family, and it's professionally done. It has a soundtrack, it has uh, uh, wonderful uh, vintage photography, and also with his family and everything else, and talking to him. Um, I, th I think you'll enjoy that. So, all right, uh, we wanna thank John. Um, here we have a little, our small Hummels town here. John's coming from, away from Missouri to see us in small town Pennsylvania, and we really appreciate it. A speaker of John's caliber, he could easily command thousands and thousands to speak for us, but he does it for free. And it's, it's his third time speaking to us, for, to us for free. So we humbly thank John for his help and his, and, and his uh, knowledge. Um, and so he was here, if you recall, uh, January 2020, uh, before we had the lockdowns and COVID all that, uh, he spoke on a book called Fire and Fortitude on the US Army in the Pacific, 1941 to 43, those of you guys that were here. And then uh, he did a Zoom, a Zoom presentation for us. He has some of his books on that one out there. Um, the Dead and Those About to Die, about the Big Red One Division on D-Day, D-Day attack by US troops on the coast of France. And now today, uh, Island Inferno's 1944 book, uh, US Army in the Pacific, 1944, John will be doing. So we look forward to that and learning a lot more about the war. John will conclude the trilogy, uh, 1945, he thinks maybe perhaps in a year, uh, he'll have the, the third book of the series for us and then I'll be complete the trilogy there. Um, so I think um, I wanted to keep it brief, as I've been told to kind of keep it brief, so I, I think I'll stop for there, but I do appreciate you guys coming. I know two years and three months, can you guys uh, uh, imagine that? Two years and three months, we have not had an in-person meeting. We had no meetings for eight months, because <laughs> of lockdown. Then we had Zoom for about, what, a year and a half, or a year or so, 
and now we're first in person for two years and three months. That's a long time, but we're happy you joined us, and you guys are our first ones back, first uh, audience back we've had, so we appreciate you, and thank you. I'll, I'll turn things over to John then next, and, and, and I'll say thanks to Charlie again. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here in person. Oh, man, what an honor. What an honor uh, to actually be here in the flesh speaking to you. Uh, it was fun last year via Zoom, but it's nice to be here, you know, like with actual dress pants on. Um, <laughs> interacting in person like human beings. I know it's been a tough go, uh, and I appreciate you, you taking the time and trouble to be here. Um, thank you to, to my old buddy Charlie Lloyd for uh, obviously inviting me and doing so much work to keep your amazing organization together, and Chris Huffman too, um, and, and Bob Watkins and so many others. Um, where I want to start is, of course, as Chris had mentioned, uh, a little discussion in my book, Island Infernos, uh, so you see where the Army is in 1944. So the whole idea behind the book, of course, it's, uh, as Chris had mentioned, the second in a, uh, in a trilogy about the Army in the Pacific. And, you know, so as, as 1944 dawns, where is the Army in the Pacific and Asia? What, what is it doing? Well, I would say it's sort of on the cusp of full maturity. Uh, it's been through a lot in a two and a half year period. Um, and so at this point, as 1944 begins, it's stretched out over just a massive amount of geography here, about a third of the world's surface of ocean, island, continent. And the army exists in that, uh, you know, that space from desolate posts in Alaska to viney choking jungles in Burma and New Guinea, the Solomon Islands from Oahu to Australia. Uh, just a dizzying array of all sorts of insignificant little stepping stone islands that contain bases, you know, with depots and whatever else. Um, so there's about, about 700,000 soldiers uh, deployed somewhere in the Pacific or Asia at that stage as 1944 begins. But of course, by the time the war comes to an end, this army uh, would have about 1.8 million soldiers. 1.8 million American ground soldiers served in uh, the war against Japan. That is the third largest army this country has ever sent overseas to fight a war. Uh, behind only, obviously, the European theater armies in World Wars I and II. And yet, I felt, as an historian, that uh, this army was uh, really anonymous relative to its size and its importance, um, that it, had, it was one aspect of the American experience in World War II that had been kind of overlooked. Um, how large was it at this, in terms of combat formations? Well, it's gonna to grow to be about 21 infantry and airborne divisions. Uh, in addition to probably, you know, multiple re regimental combat teams, uh, brigade-sized groups that, that, you know, probably accounted for another three or four divisions worth of manpower. And the other thing I should uh, uh, make clear, uh, I'm just talking about Army ground forces, uh, the, the, ar the ground troops. I'm not talking about the Army Air Forces, which, of course, during World War II, the Air Force was part of the Army, so that doesn't even include that side of the Army. Um, there was a kind of, I think, and it still remains in, in American popular memory of the war, a tendency to think that the Army focused on the ground fighting in Europe and the Marine Corps did the ground fighting in the war against Japan. Um, and this is just simply not true. Uh, the Marine Corps at full strength mobilized six divisions during World War II. It's the largest the Marine Corps ever was. Um, but, you know, as you've already seen, the size of the Army absolutely dwarfed the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps carried out 15 amphibious landings, combat landings in the course of the war. Uh, Robert Eichelberger's 8th Army alone carried out 35 in the spring of 1945 in the Philippines. Uh, so the Army carried out you know, dozens and dozens of, uh, of amphibious invasions, everything from like battalion size to of course almost like army and army group size. And so my purpose in pointing this out is not at all to denigrate the Marine Corps, it's actually the, quite the contrary. Because when you get this larger perspective, you see how the Marines were really punching above their weight and the incredible value of the Marine Corps. Uh, but you also see the kind of larger blend of the ground-oriented services that are fighting together with the Army nonetheless taking the lead role, fighting the majority of the ground battles and suffering the majority of the casualties. 42,000 soldiers would not survive, felled by combat, disease, accidents, the terrible privation of captivity, 
which is a big part of the Army's experience in the war against Japan. It was a harvest of death that totaled more than the entirety of any previous American conflict except for World War I and the Civil War. So we'll turn that over in your mind for a moment. 42,000 soldiers die in the war against Japan. That was larger than the, the deaths uh, in any single American war except for, of course, those two major wars. Uh, so even now, at the end of 1943, the beginning of 1944, thousands of these soldiers moldered in, in improvised graves in some of the most obscure, um, remote places on Earth, places like Atu, Vela La Vela, and Cabanatuan. Uh, and so it's a staggeringly complex army uh, with vast capabilities seldom seen in the course of human events. And by 1944, the army had already proven itself really adept at, uh, at a lot of different kinds of missions. So you see these, these kind of guys here, what are they doing? Uh, you know, obviously you're seeing the, the classic infantry mission there, but there's also guerrilla operations. There's joint operations with allies. There's diplomacy going on, uh, you know, with allies, with the British, with the Chinese, with the Australians, with the New Zealanders, with um, all sorts of, of associated groups, uh, sort of non-affiliated, non-national ethnic groups, tribal groups throughout the Pacific fighting alongside the army. Inner service coordination, but of course, because of course, as you saw just from looking at the map, um, the Pacific is a big, a big ocean, right? So it is really the Navy's war on a, on a lot of levels, and the Army's not going anywhere without the Navy. Uh, so inner service coordination is, of course, incredibly vital. Intel gathering, engineering, the engineering side of this war is just beyond belief. And we'll see, you know, tonight I'll, I'll give you a little bit more of a portrait of what it took to just turn remote wilderness into kind of mini American cities. Transportation, logistics, medical care on a scale unimaginable even a generation earlier, happening in some of the world's worst, most remote areas that really challenged the health of soldiers. Horrifying conditions of captivity too. That's a big part of this as well. Um, about 20,000 plus soldiers are captured by the Japanese in the course of the war, mainly in the Philippines in 1941 and 42. Uh, civil affairs are a big part of this, and of course, uh, obviously, infantry, armor, combat missions, amphibious invasions, all this kind of stuff going on. And it's a war fought by 1944 with little quarter Astra given on either side. An elemental, brutal war that really presages the, the, the American wars that are going to happen after that, when the United States is facing enemies that generally don't observe what, what Americans would hope to be the rules of war. Uh, and it, it, you see this certainly with the Japanese in World War II, and you're going to see it obviously in Korea, Vietnam, 21st century, so on and so forth. So I don't propose to take you through the Army's entire 1944 experience tonight. For that, of course, you have to buy the book and read it. I mean, obviously, that's, that's your, uh, your homework for tonight. Um, that's my little nefarious agenda. But I, I want to just focus tonight on a few key personalities and battles that maybe give you the flavor of the larger whole. Um, so by 1944, you see obviously the, the sort of lion of the theater here, General Douglas MacArthur. Um, and certainly he would think of himself as the lead actor and if this is a play, he would certainly think of himself in that light. Um, he is the Zeus of the Pacific theater. He believed in himself as a man of providential destiny. Um, and a, and a man who had some great things lined up ahead of him as 1944 would unfold. One thing that's really unique about MacArthur that no other uh, commander in World War II can say is that he had previously been the Army Chief of Staff, the number one position of the Army. Uh, and now he's a theater commander. So that just doesn't happen. The, the number one position of the Army is the number one position. You don't, you don't descend to something else, but through a unique set of circumstances, he had. He had retired in the, in the mid-1930s, uh, as chief of staff, he had gone to the Philippines to, to basically create a military force that could defend the archipelago once the Filipinos got their independence, the thinking was in 1946. Congress had passed what was called the, the, the Tidings McDuffie Act, designed to give the Philippines its independence in 1946, so MacArthur had tried to transition the archipelago to help defend itself. And so as that happens, the war begins and he ends up in command of what becomes known as the Southwest Pacific Area Theater or SWAPA, as it's generally called. Um, you see him here, 
with some of his, uh, some of his staffers and commanders. Most notably, uh, you see Lieutenant General Walter Kruger is one of his key ground commanders. The, the guy standing next to him is uh, eventually Major General Steve Chamberlain, who is his operations officer that is arguably the most important staff officer on, on any staff. Um, and, but the staff was enormous, of course. Uh, and <laughs> it also had uh, foreign liaison officers attached to it, and one of them Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Wilkinson, a British liaison officer with SWAPA headquarters, wrote about MacArthur, he said, he is shrewd, selfish, proud, remote, highly strong, and vastly vain. <laughs> this is very much penetrating insight here. And then he continued, he says, he has imagination, self-confidence, physical courage and charm, but no humor about himself, no regard for truth, and is unaware of these defects. <laughs> And then he says, with moral depth, he would be a great man. As it is, he's a near miss, which may be worse than a mile. His main ambition would be to end the war as Pan-American hero in the form of Generalissimo of all Pacific theaters. Um, dead on. I mean, that's exactly what MacArthur would want. MacArthur adamantly opposed the idea of splitting up uh, um, different chains or theaters of command uh, in the war against Japan. He wanted the whole theater to be under... Uh, under one person's command, and that makes military logic and military sense, of course. But when you're talking about a theater that vast, it's easier said than done. And when you're talking about tense uh, Army-Navy relations, and the Navy quite properly, you know, feeling that maybe they should have the commander-in-chief of the whole thing, and the Army saying, well, no, maybe not so much, and the Navy conversely saying, we're not going to serve under MacArthur, you can see why things end up as they do. MacArthur with his SWAPA theater, and Admiral Chester Nimitz, another incredibly important figure, of course, uh, in command of most everything else, uh, you know, in terms of oceanic operations and also ground and air and all that. Um, he is, of course, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, so on and so forth. So you end up with this kind of compromise, and you end up uh, with Wilkinson, I think, really pegging MacArthur on a lot of levels. So by early 1944, MacArthur's dilemma is that he hasn't advanced very far. You know, um, he's advanced across about 350 miles of New Guinea wasteland, uh, one of the world's largest islands. And uh, that's taken about a year and a half. And that represents about a third of the island's extensive northern coast. And in order to get back to the Philippines, which of course is his grand design up here, and he's stuck down here, obviously you've got to get across the rest of that New Guinea coast. Easier said than done. So if the radio is traveling or advancing, you know, it might take him two, three, four years. Uh, to get onto the Philippines. And so he's deeply worried uh, that at the same time he seems to be bogged down uh, in New Guinea, Nimitz, uh, his theater, had these major advances across these island groups here, the Gilberts, the Marshalls, and so on and so forth, uh, that, that had advanced the, the Allies about 2,000 miles across the Pacific through an island hopping campaign. Okay, so MacArthur is really worried that the Joint Chiefs back in Washington, D.C. are going to consign him to a kind of a backbencher role, just sort of protecting Nimitz's flank as Nimitz advances directly towards the Japanese home islands, and that MacArthur would just sort of babysit uh, the, the remainder of Japanese military forces and be, again, consigned to this kind of subordinate role. He's terrified of that. Certainly, on a personal level, he feels that would be beneath him, a man of his station, um, but really what is animating him is a great desire to get back to the Philippines and liberate the archipelago from the Japanese yoke. As I think many of you know, the MacArthur family already had deep roots, deep ties uh, in the Philippines and with the, with the Filipino people. Uh, and obviously, Douglas had lived a, li a lot of his life there. He had uh, been, you know, had, had to leave the Philippines when, uh, when the Allied military forces collapsed there in 1942. And he yearned for that kind of redemption. Okay, so within the first few months, uh, four months of 1944, he makes two bold moves that greatly accelerate his timetable and make it now possible to get back to the Philippines. Okay, so the first one happens at this otherwise anonymous place uh, called Los Meg Negros and Manus. Um, the significance of these two spots, you can see they're in the Admiralty Islands just north of the New Guinea coast. Okay, now hardly anybody knew about these places, but you know, they're made important in the context of this uh, South Pacific struggle. Because islands become, can become airfields, air, airplanes can be deadly to ships, 
Airplanes can give you, uh, you know, good close air support for your ground operations uh, and for your supply, your, your medevac, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so if you have air bases in the Admiralties, uh, it makes possible greatly accelerated operations along the North New Guinea coast. Okay, so his outstanding air commander, Lieutenant General George Kenney, comes to him in February 1944 and excitedly tells him that his, um, uh, his aviators on reconnaissance flights have found very little evidence of, of uh, Japanese presence, as much in the way of a Japanese garrison on Los Negros and, and uh, neighboring Manus. So you can see in the closer inset, you can see how these islands fit together. Okay, so he urges MacArthur to put together a, a quick grab task force to go in and grab what's called the Momoti Airfield um, right there on, uh, on Los Negros. And then you'll have, and, and the county will develop that airfield, you'll have, uh, you'll have bombers, you'll have fighters, you have all the things you need to, to continue to advance in New Guinea. Okay, but it's not quite that simple. What if he's wrong? <laughs> you know? Uh, what, I mean, it's just photos. What if the Japanese are hiding? Uh, what if, what if, what if? Uh, so under that premise of, well, we need more information, by now, MacArthur's command, and specifically what was becoming known as the Sixth Army under Lieutenant General Kruger, whom I pointed out to you a moment ago, had created a, uh, a special elite group known as the Alamo Scouts. And the Alamo Scouts were volunteers, they were hand-picked guys, uh, highly trained, specially trained for reconnaissance missions. So they are to be sent in to probably Japanese-held areas to go and scout around and figure out right there, bona fide on the ground, the Japanese military strength and presence before you send in the main operation. You know? so, uh, so their job isn't to trade bullets with the enemy, quite the contrary, you don't, you don't want that. Things are going very badly if you do that. You're the eyes and ears. And it, it's actually what the Alamo Scouts do in World War II, it, it really presages and is remarkably similar to what, a, what another group in uh, the Vietnam War is gonna do. Long range reconnaissance patrols, generally known as LERPs, uh, that are gonna go into NVA held areas and do a lot of the same kind of missions. So in this case, the Alamo Scouts, a small team of them, about half a dozen plus guys, are inserted by flying boat into Los Negros in late February 1944 to go sniff around, okay? And they are literally right there in the Japanese backyard. In fact, they're so close to the Japanese um, that, they, that, that a Japanese patrol passes by within about 10 feet of them. But so thick is the jungle, the Japanese could not see them. So you can imagine what a heart-stopping moment that must have been. Well, they're seeing evidence of much more Japanese presence and resistance than Kenny's photographs had revealed. So when they're extracted, they're telling MacArthur, well, you know, there's a lot of Japanese guys there. Uh, so I don't know if you ought to go in, it's your call. So that's a tough decision for MacArthur. He, the, the best, um, the most troops he can put in initially is about 1,000 a, about a to 1,100 guys who are part of the 1st Cavalry Division, what's called a, a Task Force Brewer. And you know it's because of shipping and supply issues and eventually you're gonna have to resupply. So do you go in and risk annihilation for these guys or not? Uh, and MacArthur makes what is a pretty bold decision. I'm gonna send them in and then I'm gonna try and reinforce them the best I can. I'm gonna hope for the best. So they go in on February 29, 1944 in the invasion of Los, Manos, uh, Los Negros. Um, and it begins this, this kind of uh, build up on either side. The Japanese expected an invasion, but they expected it at a different spot. They thought it would come over here in the larger bay. Uh, instead, the, the initial task force brewer comes in here, grabs the Momoti airfield, then holds on, then they're reinforced, uh, and over time, the, the Americans build up stronger and they, they basically win that airfield on Los Negros. They expand on their patrols and operations at Manus. So it's a big win for SWAPA, for MacArthur, for the Americans, um, and it accelerates greatly the pace of operations on New Guinea, which then allows him, uh, whoops, wrong one, uh, then allows him to invade at a place called Hollandia on April 22nd, 1944. Okay, so this is a much larger operation. The 24th and 41st Infantry Divisions go in, as you see, on that, that kind of pincer style operation uh, on April 22nd. And the interesting thing about this, it's made possible certainly by what's happened at Los Negros and Manus uh, in accelerating the timetable, eventually making the shipping available. Uh, the 24th and the 41st had been, had been training for months. 41st had fought uh, elsewhere in New Guinea in 1942 and early 43, uh, and had been refitted and were primed for combat, okay? So uh, the other thing that had happened is a major intelligence coup. During the run-up to the, before the Hollandia invasion, 
Uh, MacArthur had been planning to, to invade somewhere else at a place called Hansa Bay and close to Wewak. Well, as the Japanese were retreating, mainly from Australians in late 1943, retreating west to New Guinea, um, they were having to leave behind equipment, weaponry, materiel, because it's just, you just couldn't carry it all out. Uh, and the condition of their troops was not good. They're diseased, they're, they're hot, they're struggling, they want to get out of there. And so they had left behind uh, some of their code books. <laughs> you see where this is heading? Um, <laughs> The, the Japanese officer responsible for this has the, the main code book for the Imperial Japanese Army in New Guinea buried in a, um, uh, like a, sort of like the, the equivalent of a footlocker, like a, like a metal footlocker, and sunk in a swamp. And he figures, oh, well, they'll never find it there. They'll never go to the bottom of that swamp. They'll never get in there. It'll all rust, and it'll be destroyed in the meantime. Uh, and so he very disingenuously reports to his superiors that the code books themselves were actually destroyed. Uh, but they didn't. They put them inside that box. Why didn't they destroy them? Because they got moist and moldy and they were impossible to burn. So under this sort of exigency, they just hurriedly put it in there. And, uh, you know, you see what happens. The Australians come, they find the, the, uh, the container, they find the, the pages, and they're wet and sopping, but they use early microwave technology to basically uh, dry and bake the, the pages, and they glean out what the codes were. And so when that happens, it allows MacArthur to get a very good picture of the Japanese order of battle, like where they were located on the North New Guinea coast and where they are not. And, they re and he realized they're really strong at Hansa Bay and at Wewak, so why don't we outflank them behind them at Hollandia, where they, we know they're weak. And we'll get behind them, we'll compromise them, they'll be sort of checkmated, we'll build a major American base, and we'll continue on to the Philippines from there. Okay, so um, this again happens April 22nd, 1944. And it's under the, the command of uh, one of his, his outstanding ground commanders, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger. More on him in a moment. Uh, the invasion is a major success. It takes the Japanese heavily by surprise. I should also mention, too, in addition to the in intel side, uh, Kenny's aviators had destroyed much of the Japanese uh, Air Force on the ground as a prelude to this. Uh, destroyed about 100 to 180 Japanese planes on the ground. So this gave you freedom of motion in the air. And it secured uh, for your fleet the ability to operate near what would have been dangerous Japanese air bases. Okay, so um, the two divisions, the 24th and the 41st, uh, come in and meet up. Uh, they, they begin to build airfields here. Uh, the Japanese are sent into the wilds of the jungle and compromise on either side of this flank. And you can see in the, in the inset map there. And so now the task for Eichelberger in the wake of this is to, you know, to build a, a major base that you can use to advance to the Philippines. So the other thing MacArthur understood now too, his two key ground commanders, Kruger and Eichelberger, two of the key figures in the entire Pacific War, uh, were really at odds. Um, a distinct antipathy and rivalry had developed between them by this stage in 1944. Um, so in order to, to meet them, let's take a closer look here. There's uh, Lieutenant General Robert, or excuse me, Walter Kruger. A uh, very fitting picture, I think, of him, because here he is interacting with soldiers, one of his favorite things to do. Um, Kruger was 63 by 1944, and he, you, would, uh, you may remember he commanded the Admiralty's operation. Uh, he is now commander of Sixth Army. He's the rarest of birds among American general officers in World War II. He's foreign born. Only two American general officers in World War II were foreign born. Walter Kruger, who was born in Germany, and Ben Lear, who was born in Canada. I don't know if that really counts, but uh, he was born in Canada. But Kruger, of course, uh, grew up with a different language. Uh, he was a son of a German army officer who died when Kruger was uh, an adolescent. And so um, Kruger's mother, uh, he was an only child, Kruger's mother uh, took them to America. They emigrated to America. Interestingly for me, because I'm, I'm from St. Louis, uh, they, they came to St. Louis. And the reason they came to St. Louis is that Kruger's uncle owned a brewery. And that's very, very um, uh, revealing because uh, German-American owned breweries were a huge part of the St. Louis economy in the late 19th century. When Prohibition came along, uh, it, it really socked the St. Louis economy and a lot of those small breweries that never really came back. Uh, so Kruger, then think about this. You know, he comes here as a, as a kid, um, has to, to learn a new culture, a new language. Um, he spoke English. Uh, with, with hardly even a trace of an accent. and was very proud of that for his entire life. He had a facility with languages, obviously he knew German, but he also spoke Spanish and French too. Um, and so 
when the Spanish-American War broke out in, in 1898, Kruger decided he wanted to serve, and he joined the Army as a 17-year-old private. So here's another thing that makes him a rare bird, not just being foreign-born, but commissioned from the ranks to ultimately become a four-star general. Yeah, with no West Point pedigree, not only that, no college degree. <laughs> and so he, he's a private, and then he's a, you know, a, a high-ranking NCO, then he's commissioned, ironically enough, in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War. He didn't see combat against Spain, he saw combat in the Philippines, uh, you know, when, when you have this, uh, really, an imperial war, the Americans are fighting to turn the Philippines into a colony in the wake of Spanish-American War. Uh, so Kruger had served there, he'd become an officer there, and he's, he's just this incredible autodidact. Uh, he writes scholarly articles for military journals. Uh, so in a way, he's ahead of his West Point trained peers in some respects, um, and he's a very dedicated soldier. Uh, he's married to his wife, Grace, very dedicated husband. He has three children, two sons and, and a daughter. Uh, you know, and his son, uh, Walter Jr., was, a, was an officer as well. Uh, and he had another son, Jimmy, who was, who was an officer too. So, you know, th this is a kind of soldier family. Um, in terms of his personality, uh, I've given you sort of the good side, the bad side. Um, he's not a touchy-feely kind of guy. He's very gruff. He's very brusque. He's cantankerous. He's obtuse sometimes in social situations. Um, you know, all that masks, of course, great depth. But he could be off-putting uh, because he could be very rude to you uh, without maybe even <laughs> knowing it. You know, so um, he was he was certainly respected in the army, but not always beloved by many of his colleagues. Um, he's famous for checking on soldiers and their welfare because he had been a private soldier. You know, and so he's he he would go and visit with guys like you see here, and have these you know one-on-one -on -one conversations with privates and say, ask them how they're eating, how they're clothed, how they're fed, whether they've had dry socks lately. Um, you know, he, he believes strongly in the human factor in war. This is a great quote, I think, that he, that he loved to say. Weapons are no good unless there are guts at both ends of the bayonet. Um, very much a Kruger kind of phrase. <laughs> a close friend once said of him, he clung to what he thought was right with a bulldog's grip. You know, and that, that is definitely Kruger, you know. So um, Kruger, Kruger's visit to your command could be a little uncomfortable. You know, if you're, if you're a company commander, you're a battalion commander, you're a regimental commander, division commander, you know, because he's asking your soldiers, how are you treated? Are your officers taking care of you? Are, are you led properly is what he might as well be saying. And he had, uh, you know, he found out one time that uh, uh, one division mess um, had had uh, fresh eggs that they, they were eating, you know, back at division HQ and their mess, fresh eggs, and that the, the, the infantrymen at the front were not getting it. And he, he basically told the division commander, uh, fresh eggs are for the combat soldiers. So in other words, like, I better not hear of that again. You know, so Kruger was very much an advocate for the, for the average soldier. Uh, so too was his great rival, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, right there in the middle, um, who does have a West Point pedigree. Um, he is, uh, he's 57 at this point, 1944. He had commanded I Corps under Kruger, and before that he had commanded in New Guinea. Uh, eventually he's gonna be an Army commander on par with Kruger in command of 8th Army. You see him pictured with two of his key intimate aides um, during, during the war, Clovis Byers on the left, who was his chief of staff, and was really not like just a colleague, he was um, like a younger brother for, for General Eichelberger. Um, they had a very, very close bond. And Clovis Byers had a, had a long and very successful military career ahead of him. On the right is Bob Bowen, who is, uh, of course, uh, Eichelberger's G3, his operations officer, and, and an indispensable person to Eichelberger. Um, Eichelberger's background is quite interesting, too. He was the son of a um, Union Civil War veteran from Ohio, very successful lawyer and uh, sort of gentleman farmer from Urbana, Ohio. And uh, Bob was, was the youngest of five children. And um, the, the, the dad would love to put the children through their paces, almost like a, <laughs> like a real life reality show kind of thing, you know, where they would be constantly competing with one another uh, in all these different kind of mental and physical pursuits and whatever, you know, and, and for the father's approval kind of thing. And he's the youngest, you know, so he's behind his brothers and sister, and he can't compete at the same level, and he isn't taken seriously. You know, and this just really forms his personality of having to, to sort of burning to achieve uh, and kind of show people what he could do and, and find his niche. And he, of course, finds it in soldiering. He goes to West Point, uh, uh, graduates in the class of 1909, um, 
and, you know, really just, just finds his way. He's genial, he's courteous, he's likable, he has friends everywhere in the army. He's a very um, charming, kind of enjoyable person to be around. He's a good conversationalist. He's nice and considerate and respectful, which is one of the reasons why he can't stand Kruger, because he's so darn rude, you know? He's like, how can anyone be that way, you know? And, and so to Eichelberger, this is just, this is beyond the pale, but he's no soft soap rear area soldier. He's a hardcore combat soldier who leads from the front. He had won the first American ground victory in World War II at the Battle of Buna at the end of 1942, and he'd done it by leading himself from the front. He left 30 pounds in 30 days. They're fighting in swamps and jungles. He's leading with a Tommy gun at the front, like a squad leader, you know? So um, in World War I, when his classmates were fighting on the Western Front, he goes and serves in Siberia, in Russia, in what's called the Polar Bear Expedition, the, the Western Allied attempt to snuff out the Bolshevik communist regime, and they get involved in the Russian Civil War and all that. So Eichelberger saw combat there. He was an intel officer there. He had learned a lot about war and conflict and leadership. And interestingly enough, of course, the Japanese were part of that too, so he had studied the Japanese in his early years too. He had learned the Distinguished Service Cross uh, for valor. He eventually was a two-time recipient of the DSC. Um, and on the personal side, he has this incredibly deep bond with his soulmate, Emma. Now, they don't have any kids. They have themselves, and they have Bob's career. And Eichelberger found time practically every day during the war, believe it or not, whether he was in combat or not, to write to Emma, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a day. Uh, remarkable missives that are just like gold for an historian, as you can imagine, because Eichelberger really is an historian on a lot of levels. He thinks that way, and he preserves that way. After the war, he has these incredible dictations that are just hundreds of pages worth of memories of World War II and thoughts on leadership and various personalities and uh, certainly a lot of spleen against Kruger, as you can imagine, against uh, a couple of people who he didn't like. But for the most part, he's full of praise, but but uh, Eichelberger is very much a, a kind of a commentator, observer, and participant on a lot of levels. So one of his uh, great confidants is chemical officer Colonel Harold Riegelman said of him, General Eichelberger had a rare way with people. His responsiveness and geniality were sparked by a fine sense of humor, his stories on the subtle side, his talent for listening, attentive and appreciative. Of course, he's ambitious too. Uh, he wants to, to go down with great military glory as a great battle captain, and he did nurse resentments. You know. So why the antipathy? Well, he's got a lot more combat experience than Kruger. So they kind of resent serving under him you know, in 1943. Um, he felt deeply insulted, as I mentioned, by Kruger's careless brusqueness sometimes uh, during a lot of interactions. He believed that Kruger was trying to hold him back from army command, which may have been true. Um, Kruger, in turn, felt that Eichelberger was too aggressive because Kruger tended toward the, the word you'll hear often describe him as cautious, and that's true on some levels, but he's also, he's intelligently cautious, I think we might say at times too, but, uh, but yeah, they're very, they're cut from very different cloth. Eichelberger is much more of a risk taker. He's much more bold. Um, and Kruger thought he was too indulgent with his staff because he was nice, you know. Um, Eichelberger was extremely talented, and Kruger might have resented that too, possibly. So their rivalry endures the rest of the war, and MacArthur really quite intelligently learns to play one off against the other to get the most performance of, out of both. Um, so after the successful invasion of Hollandia, uh, Eichelberger's task now is to oversee the, the development of this jungle wilderness into a major staging base for the advance of the Philippines. And he later wrote, he wrote, an, he wrote an incredible memoir, by the way. It's called Our Jungle Road to Tokyo, which I highly recommend if you've never read it. Um, My job is to direct traffic and road construction, he wrote, and to demand speed, speed, speed. Road construction was a gigantic task. Sides of mountains were carved away. Bridges and culverts were thrown across rivers. Gravel and stone fill was poured into Sago swamps to make uh, highways as tall as Mississippi levees. That's what he's got in front of him. Under his supervision, Army engineers built three major airfields fed by 72 miles of two and four lane roads. They laid down 135 miles of fuel pipeline to pump the aviation gasoline. They constructed three million feet of warehouse and building space, uh, developed a harbor with a floating jock, uh, three jetties, a 30 ton floating crane, tugboats, motorboats, steel barges, petroleum storage facilities, all of this high-tech stuff. Hollandia could accommodate an impressive 140,000 troops, and it handled more supply tonnage than any other port on New Guinea. 
and it represented this very unglamorous but vital importance of the logistics in the Army's vast supply and construction responsibilities. By the end of the year, 8,000 tons of material was arriving on New Guinea each month. 800,000 tons, sort of like this, like you see here. The incredible productivity came at a really high price. Overwork, exhaustion, low morale, constant battle with the elements in this terrible place. And you can imagine the strain on the overstretched port companies was immense. Many of the soldiers serving in the port companies were African Americans serving in segregated units, working long hours, squalid conditions, occasionally ha harassed by Japanese air raids. Uh, they're unloading and moving freight, they're building roads, and they're doing it as part of a segregated force, treated as second-class citizens quite often, not allowed to go into combat at times, through partially, partially through racism, but partially through inertia, partially just by the war moving on, um, all of the above kind of. So, uh, but it's not just, of course, African-American soldiers who are dealing with the wilds, it's, it's whites too. And regardless of the racial mores of the time, everyone's in the same boat in terms of being miserable on New Guinea. Um, you know, practically look at the place and you have malaria. Um, horrible. Uh, the place seemed designed by Mother Nature to confound and harass humanity. There's no indigenous waste facilities. Soldiers burned or buried untold tons of noxious garbage. Some of it's probably still there deep in the sediment today. They loaded aboard barges for burial at sea. For, um, shall we say, elimination, uh, they built trenches, dug trenches, or um, took 55-gallon drums to serve as toilets. Luckless privates drew the terrible job of spraying fuel on the offal and burning it all in the tropical heat. That's another preview of Vietnam. Uh, ask any Vietnam veteran who did that job in, in Vietnam, and they will tell you precisely that it's not a fond memory. Uh, the stench, like you wouldn't believe. Temperatures, usually in the 80s and 90s, humidity nearing 100%. So hot outside, sweat comes out like water out of a squeezed sponge, one officer wrote to his wife. Mold inundated everything. Equipment moldered and rusted quickly. Ammunition degraded and ruined. Millions of dollars worth of supplies went to waste on New Guinea. In one, this is a microcosm, in one food shipment at Finchhaven, 25% of corned beef and 37% of tomato and fruit juice was found unfit consum for consumption. Very typical. Engineers purified millions of gallons of stream and river water. Soldiers subsisted on canned rations, tinned fruit, tinned vegetables, greasy spam, Vienna sausages, Stomach-churning, dehydrated potatoes, eggs, and milks. Makes you hungry right now, doesn't it? Thinking about all that. Mmm, yummy. Um, <laughs> wait till you hear this. There was a brand of GI butter that, the good news was, it was impervious to melting in the heat. The bad news, it had the consistency of gelatinous grease. So not really what you want out of butter on your potato or something. Um, I think anyone in New Guinea would have given his right arm for a glass of cold, fresh milk quipped Lieutenant Colonel Milton Cloud, a physician uh, at Oro Bay. Rats and insects plagued the troops. Uh, I think, personally, the Pacific War was something of an inter interspecies war. You were fighting the mosquitoes and the other critters as much as the Japanese. Um, the ants are simply exasperating, Sergeant Paul Kinder wrote in a letter to his friends. You cannot put anything down but that they find it. Anything that one, do one doesn't seal airtight. Where you think of them in the hundreds, I have them by millions. And from tiny, pesky, quarter-inch ones on up to an inch in length of all species and colors. Kinder once made the mistake of leaving a candy bar unattended for about an hour. When he came back, he found the ants had been devoured the entire candy bar. Just surreal. New Guinea swamps and jungles teemed with disease-bearing insects. There was a new strain of scrub typhus that they found out about that no one had ever seen before, and, and no Westerner, I guess. Um, they called it scrub typhus, and they, they found that it was borne by tiny mites uh, that clung to grass blades. And of course, as a soldier, you're moving through those grass blades, and probably with short sleeves, and you can see how this would happen, you know. So uh, scrub typhus would, was spreading rapidly, and it had a 4% fatality rate, 4% fatality rate, before they started to get it under control. Mosquitoes spread malaria in massive waves, absorbing enormous efforts and resources in SWAPA just to prevent the total debilitation of MacArthur's armies. At one point in 1943, malaria was claiming five 
Allied soldiers, uh, through every one, uh, made a casualty in combat against the Japanese. Five down with malaria for every one lost in combat. Only good news, the disease was usually not fatal by 1943 and 44. Though the average case sidelined a soldier for about a month and usually led to relapses. By mid-1944, there were 47 specially formed anti-malaria units operating on New Guinea. The number had doubled by September, more than doubled. Um, commanders were expected to ruthlessly enforce anti-malaria measures, such as what? The wearing of leggings, um, long sleeves at night, sleeping under mosquito netting, and the application of, of course, uh, of insect repellent. But of course, leggings and long sleeves are not pleasant to be wearing in that kind of tropical heat, so soldiers resisted that, as you might imagine. Not everyone had a mosquito net, and not everyone had insect repellent. So really, the number one measure was pharmaceutical. Uh, specifically the taking of Atabrine, a drug that suppressed the symptoms of the disease. Didn't cure it, but it suppressed the symptoms. So medics, sergeants, and junior officers alternately threatened, ordered, or cajoled their people to take their Atabrine tablets. That was a big part of your job as a small unit leader. And at the senior level, you were expected, from, by, from MacArthur on down, to see that this happened in your command. They battled hesitancy and lurid rumors that the drug caused psychosis, true in rare cases, or a much more damaging rumor that the drug caused sterility. Absolute nonsense, but you can imagine how the word spread and how people wouldn't take it. It's like, you know, you can imagine, take your Atterbury, oh yeah, that causes sterility. Wow, there's no evidence of that. They're, you think they're gonna tell you that? You know, I mean, that's exactly the, the mindset there. <laughs> uh, so, one division uh, surgeon uh, asserted with total exasperation, he says, stress must be laid on the fact that Atterbury is harmless. Temporary neuroses and vomiting may affect a small percentage of those taking Atabrine for the first time, he conceded. But he's like, yeah, just make them take it, you know? But the simple reality was it worked. And the Army was fortunate to have it. If it hadn't had Atabrine, I don't know what would have happened. In Milne Bay alone, after the mass administration of Atabrine, cases declined from, get this, a staggering 3,308 per 1,000 soldiers. So in other words, everyone had it three times to a comparatively infinitesimal 31. So Atabrine is what allows MacArthur to maintain the momentum of these operations we've just been talking about. Um, the good news in the bigger picture was the Japanese were in far worse shape, way worse shape by the middle to latter part of 1944. Outflanked by Hollandia, increasingly chased from the skies and seas by the, the incredible, um, excellent work of Lieutenant General Kenny and his aviators, and the, and the United States Navy, which is growing prodigiously in strength and power and purpose at this stage too. Um, and of course, their wayward ground troops are getting weakened daily by the conditions, by, uh, by starvation, by disease. Uh, they don't have you know, the, the anti-malarial drugs they need, you know, and so, you know, but they're comparatively still potent. They're wandering the island wilderness and they're rotting away at isolated bases, but we'll see they have some potency left. But in the meantime, it's a nightmare for them. Many began referring to New Guinea as a green desert. An eerie phrase circulated among the Japanese troops, from New Guinea, no one comes back alive. One shuddered to his diary, the fearfulness of living in the jungle cannot be expressed in words. My friends are dead. I am steadily growing lonely. To end my life at 25 is regrettable. This is my fate. I cannot help it. And then the last entry, you just wrote, oh, God, and then it trailed off, and that was it. You know, uh, the, the Allies captured hundreds, if not thousands, of Japanese diaries in the course of the war. Uh, the Allied uh, translator and interpreter section under Tswapa translated them, and, and it's just for, for a story, and these are remarkable sources. Um, one, many of them, of course, simply laid down and died. Their carcasses were soon devoured by jungle animals and insects or decompose rapidly in the tropical heat. Um, Private Masagatsu Ogawa, a rare survivor, recalled after the war of his perilous trek through the New Guinea wilderness in 1944. He wrote, lack of protein fostered a kind of madness in us. We ate anything, flying insects, worms, and rotten palm trees. We fought over the distribution of those worms. If you managed to knock down a lizard with a stick, you'd pop it in, into your mouth while its tail was wriggling. Of 7,000 men in his unit, only 67 survived. Incredible. Well, desperate though they were, 
uh, the Japanese are going to react to the success of Atlanta. Any successful flanking movement risks, uh, and probably will inevitably have a, a, a reaction, you know, which the enemy counterattacks against that successful bold move. And indeed, this is what happens in uh, uh, New Guinea. Uh, in what we in the Northern Hemisphere would call the summer of 1944, but of course in the Southern Hemisphere, so it's winter, but I'm talking about like the July to, to September months, well, really June to September months, okay? So what you're seeing there is um, operations of the Japanese against Sixth Army from the, from the east, here at Wewak and Ate, see Hollandia there in the middle, and then of course over here at Sarmi where the Japanese are gonna try pincers operations to try and crush the Hollandia base. So rather than just staying in place and dying in the jungle and ineffectually doing nothing, even though they're weakened, they're gonna try and attack. Okay, so this leads to major fighting on the western flank at what becomes known as Lone Tree Hill um, by the 158th Regimental Combat Team and the 6th Infantry Division uh, against the Japanese at Lone Tree Hill that goes on during that time frame. And then in the east, you're gonna have uh, multiple elements of multiple American divisions that you see up here they're gonna fight along what's called the Driniamore River uh, throughout much of those months in 1944. So Kruger is distracted with that and having to deal with these far-flung battles east and west, even as MacArthur's wanting to move on beyond New Guinea and get back to the Philippines. So you can see you're sort of juggling a lot of balls here. Um, it takes well into the latter part of August and September to really die down most of the Japanese resistance. And so if you're a Japanese soldier fighting there, you're either killed or you're just gonna probably die of disease or starvation in the wilderness in the aftermath. So in the meantime, MacArthur has invaded this island called Biak, which is like at the northwestern extreme of uh, off the coast of New Guinea. Purpose is to grab an, uh, a, uh, an airfield that you will use to support your advance to the Philippines and to support Nimitz's advances elsewhere in the central Pacific. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the 41st Infantry Division is given this job in late May, 1944. Um, and this is like, you, you see this pattern too often in the Pacific War, where the Allies don't really have a, quite a good grasp of, of uh, the Japanese strength. The Alamo Scouts are not sent in here because it's considered to be too dangerous and possibly that they would telegraph American intentions of invading. So you're going on the, the aerial intel and, uh, and it's inadequate. The Japanese have a pretty strong garrison there. And in this case, they've, they've started to figure out that it makes more sense to fight inland you know, use some of the good defensive terrain like caves, which Biak has a lot of. Um, use the cave terrain in order to bleed the Americans because you're not gonna stop them at the waterline. And you'll see this pattern you know, soon thereafter chillingly at a place called Peleliu in September 1944. Uh, you're gonna see it, of course, in the Philippines. You're gonna see it at Iwo Jima, Okinawa, so on and so forth. So, uh, so Biak turns into this knockdown, dragout drag-out fight <coughs> where the 41st Division is kind of bogged down uh, you know, on this corridor here. And, uh, you know, so this is the kind of terrain we're talking about. Look at these caves. This is a, that, that's a man. <laughs> I mean, to give you a perspective there, uh, how large some of the caves were. So, you know, from the distance of, uh, of headquarters on New Guinea, MacArthur and Kruger are like, why isn't this wrapped up? We need to keep moving on. What's going on? And, you know, so they're juggling a lot of balls here again. And uh, the whole thing seems to be bogged down. They're able to send in a, a regiment from the 24th Division to help out. Um, and you know, at this stage, here's Kruger again, with uh, Major General Horace Fuller, the commander of the 41st Division, uh, who just seems in Kruger's view to be ineffectual. Um, this is not necessarily a fair point of view, but this is what he thinks. And remember, Kruger can't travel to every battlefield. They're so f far flung and vast. But in this case, he probably should have gone to Biak. He sends a couple of staffers to eyeball what's going on, and uh, they're like, all right, well, you know, Fuller's doing okay, but he really needs a lot of help. So Kruger sends Eichelberger in there, and once again, just like at Buna, Eichelberger just almost completely transforms the situation. Uh, usually, again, with leading from the front, classic picture of him here with a Tommy gun and, and all this. Uh, so he's partially, like a lot of good commanders, he's partially lucky in that he's been reinforced and the Japanese have been hit hard by now and he doesn't really do much different than what Fuller had wanted to do, he just does it way more effectively. Okay, so when he shows up, Fuller is really put out with Kruger. He's very angry at the, the very characteristically brusque messages that Kruger has sent him. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Blah, 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 you know, and so Fuller is so angry. 
uh, that he, he and Eichelberger are friends. I know that'll shock you. You know, it's like, who isn't a friend of Eichelberger? He, they're classmates. So Eichelberger goes in there and he says, just, just, you know, I'm using 21st century slang. He's like, just chill out. Like, okay, we'll get this done together. You shouldn't be angry against Kruger. It's, it's okay, we will figure this out. But Fuller is so put out with this that he decides he's just gonna resign, almost like in a snit to show Kruger somehow. So Fuller leaves against the, the pre pleading of his staff. He was very, very highly uh, esteemed in the 41st division. He leaves and um, Eichelberger basically is gonna control the whole battle. Uh, and within about a week to 10 days, it is completely turned around by the latter part of June, 1944. He has won a major victory and figured out how to deal with Japanese cave disposition, some lessons learned that are gonna be applied elsewhere in the Pacific. So um, at last, once that happens, it allows MacArthur to, uh, to proceed with his invasion of the Philippines, uh, which he calls Operation King II, and this is October 1944. So they're gonna invade at Leyte, which you can see is right in the middle of the archipelago. The thinking there is you'll split the Japanese in two in the archipelago. Um, you'll have bases you'll use to advance north to Luzon and anywhere else you want to liberate in the Philippines. Um, the, the Japanese see this as a place to fight a major showdown battle to turn the war in their favor. And of course, this is what leads to the, the Battle of Leyte Gulf on October 24th and 25th, the greatest naval battle in human history, uh, and a major American victory, a close run victory in some ways, but a major American victory, of course. Uh, it's also an air battle because the Japanese are gonna send in a lot of planes that are based on Formosa, nowadays Taiwan, um, and Luzon that are really gonna hit the American beachhead and, and, uh, and environs on Leyte. But in looking at just the, the sort of amphibious operation, uh, you can see how huge it is. Four divisions are going to land there um, at Leyte on October 20th, 1944. Four divisions. The invasion fleet, 738 ships. It's enormous under Vice Admiral Tommy Kincaid's Seventh Fleet. It is larger, by the way, a larger invasion force than the American contribution to the invasion of Normandy. Isn't that amazing to think of? You know? Uh, and yet it's relatively anonymous. And in terms of the ground fighting, it's an all army operation. Okay, so you're looking there, just the four that go in, and you've got others in reserve that are eventually all gonna be thrown into the battle. Uh, so MacArthur's swap up by the end of 1944 has become the largest American ground command uh, in the world, except for, of course, Eisenhower's command in Europe. Okay, so it's an enormous army just under MacArthur. And as I had mentioned, Army units are fighting elsewhere in the Pacific too, under Nimitz and, and others, you know, so, and of course in Asia, under Joseph Stilwell and eventually Albert Wiedemeyer in what's called the CBI theater, okay? So um, this, this fleet uh, that, that takes the, the uh, ground forces to Leyte, enormous power, battleships, cruisers, escort carriers, uh, there are 151 LSTs alone uh, that, that are the key ships of war in some respects to move cargo and troops and whatnot. Um, 200,000 tons of medical supplies, one and a half million tons of equipment, 235,000 tons of combat vehicles, 200,000 tons of ammo. Basically, you've got a, about a ton of stuff for every man who's going ashore. Man, just think about that. It all has to be moved. It all has to be stored. It all has to be shipped with these moving American cities. You also have, of course, Admiral William Halsey's fleet as well that adds another 105 warships uh, including nine fleet carriers and eight light carriers that's gonna fight the Battle of Leyte Gulf, of course, right? So the invasion force is enormous. And in order to service it all, these guys are overlooked on the naval side, Rear Admiral Robert Glover's service force, a fleet of oilers, water tankers, salvage ships, ammo ships, sustained it. 50,000 sailors, 150,000 soldiers. The freshwater demands were voracious. One water tanker alone, microcosm here, dispense 43,608 barrels of water to 125 vessels, just one water tanker. And so what you're seeing here is a Navy that has begun to master forward logistics, logistics while moving at sea, logistics while continuing operations. And obviously that is vital, you know? So the invasion unfolds, as I mentioned on the 20th, MacArthur wrote to his, uh, his soulmate and wife, Jean, the night before, he said, tomorrow we land, I am in good fettle and hope to do my part tomorrow and the days that follow. Um, he was aboard USS Nashville, which is a cruiser. The, the Japanese are caught flat-footed at Leyte. They had only one division ashore, but as you see from the map, 
they're going to decide to reinforce it and fight this showdown land battle there. Um, this was against what the Japanese ground commander, General Yamashita, wanted to do. He was told by higher-ups from Imperial General Headquarters this is what they were going to do. And so Leite turns into this sort of protracted uh, battle of attrition that plays out that fall in 1944. And we can say the fall because this is Northern Hemisphere now. Um, you know, and, and it just, just sucks in combat power from both sides, air, land, and sea. MacArthur comes ashore, sets up his headquarters at Tacloban uh, in the Walter Scott Price House. Price, by the way, had served in the Philippine-American War, had, uh, had made a life for himself in the Philippines, a very well-off businessman, had married a local person, local woman, um, and had been apprehended by the Japanese earlier in the war and incarcerated as a civilian internee. Regretfully, he would not survive the war. He died in 1945. But his house becomes MacArthur's headquarters. It's, uh, it's under Japanese bombs of air raids frequently during the campaign. The Americans don't really control the air during the battle, much of the Battle of Leyte. The, the uh, Chinese aviators are just kind of holding on, uh, pushing the Japanese away as best they can, but they don't really control the air. So it turns into, as I mentioned, this horrible protracted struggle. The weather is beyond belief how bad it is. Um, look at this. That's what you'd see. Mud, mud, and more of it. Three typhoons swept through Leyte in October and November, dumping 35 inches of rain on the island. Major General John Hodge, the 24th Corps commander, later said his men were, quote, never dry from the time they got ashore until the battle was over. Lieutenant Gage Rodman of the 7th Division wrote that the mud was knee deep and shiny. Every slow spot was a thin soup of dirt and water. Digging a foxhole amounted to digging a bathtub. <laughs> you see here, tanks, trucks, other vehicles sank and could not be recovered. Moving supplies to the front became a might nightmare. Most of the fighting took place on the high ground, what's called the Cordillera Range and the, the sort of central spine of Leyte. Uh, so just getting stuff there was difficult. Engineers could not build stable roads and airfields because of the, the water table and the mud and the terrible weather and just the infrastructure wasn't good. And the other thing too, you know, you're having to feed the locals because remember, guerrillas are a big part of your operations here and will be throughout the whole Philippines, but also the humanitarian operations too. Um, it's, Leyte is one of the biggest battles of World War II. Uh, and I don't propose to walk you through the whole thing. I just want to give you a few takeaways on Leyte. Fighting raged around the clock. Huge numbers of small unit actions, mainly over these remote stretches of high ground that coated that central part of the island. Uh, in general, neither side took prisoners. As of December 26, when Eichelberger's newly created 8th Army took over responsibility for the battle, fighting was still going on long after MacArthur had decreed that it was over and it was just mopping up and all that. And MacArthur had that tendency. Uh, and it was, it was, in this case, it was a nonsense. Um, Eichelberger estimated that he lost 432 killed and over 1,800 wounded during these so-called mop-up operations. And the fighting lasted into May 1945. So Leyte went on a long time. And as I mentioned, Filipino guerrillas played a key role, uh, giving intel and a support role for the whole campaign. Second, the Americans never really controlled the air, as I mentioned. Most of your planes were absorbed in just fighting off the Japanese raiders. Um, and you know, MacArthur, the experience of this, MacArthur resolved never to launch another invasion without complete control of the air from his land-based air that General Kenny controlled. He was glad to get help from the Navy when he could, but he knew that he could not use the fleet carriers for ground operations for a long period of time. They'd be too vulnerable, and they're, they're moving on to take on enemy fleets and do other missions, okay? So he wanted to make sure they'd have control from his ground-based air. Leyte teaches them that lesson. Third, logistics were a nightmare. Uh, typical division combat needed 300 tons of supplies a day just to subsist, much less attack. Commanders used any conveyance they could to try and get stuff to the front. Uh, amphibious vehicles, uh, uh, carabaos, which were, were draft animals uh, common in the Philippines, uh, carrying parties. They tried to hire Filipinos, uh, but usually it's just American troops who are hauling the stuff forward. Eventually, they used transport planes when weather permitted. C-47s from the 11th Air Cargo Resupply Squadron parachuted about 1.2 million tons of supplies during the campaign, and that really is a game changer. As I mentioned, Leyte was a humanitarian operation. So you've got to feed and care for hundreds of thousands of people. And that only added to your logistical headache. Leyte began the political transformation of the Philippines, not just to liberate the archipelago from the Japanese, but decide on its post-independence future, which is a much more difficult issue to resolve. 
all these different guerrilla groups, so man, many of them uh, represented different political blocks and different post-war agendas. Okay, and so what eventually happened to the Philippines is uh, strong communist insurgents, you know, that are gonna come very close to taking over the archipelago in the 1950s. Imagine what a disaster that would have been in the Cold War. So all of this, this whole process starts at, at uh, Leyte. Disease was rife. So we thought we had conquered disease on New Guinea, with Atabrine and all that, and incredible medical care, but it's back. Malaria's back with a vengeance, plus you've got schistosomiasis now, too, uh, because of the wet muck. Medical evacuation was really difficult. Jeeps helped, but uh, most of work sent to the rear by overworked stretcher teams, arduous kind of stuff. Four men absorbed for every casualty. The Americans made use of L-4 recon aircraft to move individual wounded, and for the first time, they began to use nascent uh, um, rudimentary helicopters uh, to get wounded out, believe it or not. Uh, only in one, as you can imagine. Neither side got what it wanted out of Leyte. The Japanese had hoped to win that showtown ba showdown battle and turn the war around. They were severely defeated. At a minimum, they lost 50,000 killed in action in ground op operations on Leyte, people they could never replace, people they couldn't use on Luzon later when operations migrated there in 1945. The U.S. lost 3,500 killed, 12,000 wounded, another 89 missing during the ground fighting. 25 sailors and aviators were killed or wounded, mainly in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So Leyte proved almost useless as a base due to its climate, its poor soil, and its lousy infrastructure. Uh, so for posterity's sake, it amounted to little more than a protracted, deadly battle of, of attrition, a prelude to the more decisive campaign on Luzon and elsewhere. Uh, so as you get to the end of 1944, uh, the Army in the Pacific had become one of the mightiest and most sophisticated military forces in human history, uh, and becoming more so by the day. The Allies had now penetrated Japan's inner defenses, and they inflicted irreplaceable losses on the Japanese. They now stood on the cusp of administering the knockout blows in 1945. I think it's fair to say the Army was going to serve as a powerful fist for those blows. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank you. Yes, sir. John, I'm going to come up to you. I got a microphone. Do you have one, Chris? Yes. Okay, we'll need to have some, some questions. So first and foremost, yeah. thank you so yeah. much for coming. Oh, sure. Sure. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have. Such a, a stress. Uh, I'm trying to think my word here. <laughs> a well known national author on the war. And you have done this four times for us. And we, we very much appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you. The one thing I didn't do yet is ask the, the uh, helmet committee to make your rounds. Are you back there? There he is. We have, uh, we pass a helmet at the end of the meeting and collect. And that gives us our sustenance to keep this going. So, uh, you all set? Ready for questions? Or? Got questions, Charlie. You got a question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, sir. How many prisoners did they take during that battle? In the, in the battle, how many prisoners did the Americans take at Leyte? Yeah. Just a handful, a few dozen. And they mostly killed themselves rather than uh, give up. Or fight to the end. Yeah, what was happening with the Japanese, you remember how I mentioned that like the, the fighting just went on for months, just ineffectually. So the Japanese, this is a pattern you'll see in the Pacific War. Um, the Japanese, when a battle ends, much to their detriment, don't necessarily surrender, of course. They just kind of fracture out into small groups and fight on or die out there. Uh, I would compare it to like a shattered mirror with all the different shards around, and you clean up all the shards, but there's still pieces out there. So on Leyte, some of them were trying to escape by sea, uh, so the, one of the, the key uh, Japanese ground commanders successfully got out of there, one of their corps commanders. Another one tried it and drowned. Um, you know, so, but, so some of them were still kind of hanging on, clinging on the west coast there um, by, the, by the end of the, the, uh, the fighting. So only a few dozen. You know, by, by the other thing I should mention, by the time the Americans invade Okinawa in April 1945, uh, the, the Allies maybe had about... I don't know, 4,000 or so Japanese prisoners under their control at that point. By the end of the Battle of Okinawa, of course, the numbers were going to go up dramatically to about 12,000 more and then eventually more after that. But yeah, at this stage, they're just kind of fighting to the finish. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. Bob? 
Thanks. Yeah, so in, in case you weren't able to hear, um, Bob was wondering whether there was consideration of invading Formosa instead of the Philippines and whether maybe the invasion, the choice to invade in the Philippines might have been a mistake um, or, or whatever. And it, yeah, one of the things, you know, I had mentioned during the talk tonight, I was just sort of giving you, I know it's hard to believe as long as I went on, but the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what was going on. And one of the things I didn't mention is that in July 1944, there was this incredible, uh, really quite fascinating high level meeting uh, at Pearl Harbor among Nimitz, uh, MacArthur, and President Roosevelt, and also Admiral William Leahy, who was his key chief of staff, and to decide on future grand strategy. It's really at that meeting that you begin to see um, the Roosevelt administration start to lean toward going to the invasion of the Philippines, uh, because MacArthur sort of gets his way. He's very persuasive, as you can imagine. He's advancing to something, uh, something of a kind of, uh, sort of political and mystical argument in a way of saying we have an obligation to liberate 17 million of our veritable countrymen and women here in the Philippines and we can't leave them behind. So what the Navy was arguing at that point conversely, especially Admiral Ernest King, who was not at the meeting significantly, is that Formosa would have been a get better go because it's closer to Japan. You could use it as a stepping stone either to Japan or to the Chinese mainland. You can bypass the Philippines and avoid all the fighting you were gonna have in the archipelago. I mean, there's 7,000 plus islands that comprise the Philippines and, and you could spare the Filipinos from having war come to their doorstep. Um, my view is there's either way you go, you're gonna end up with a really rough situation on your hands because Formosa was heavily defended and a lot of the population would have been hostile, convert, you know, total opposite of the Philippines, which is largely a pro-American population. Um, so you're gonna deal with that. You're, you're not gonna get much in the way of good basing and ports there. Um, and you know, you were gonna have that Philippines bone in your throat as, as you went farther. There was gonna be an exposed flank there too. Like on the other hand, when you invade in the Philippines, as we know, you end up with a lot of these bloodbaths and you bring war to the Philippines. You know, um, and that's gonna lead eventually to the Battle of Manila, which is one of the greatest tragedies of World War II. Uh, the destruction of that beautiful city, the loss of 100,000 Filipino lives and all that. So I really think no matter which way you go, you're gonna end up with a, a humanitarian catastrophe on your hands. Um, you know, they, what MacArthur was arguing in relation to the Philippines too is that a lot of our POWs were there and that they needed to be liberated. Um, and this was a fairly compelling argument too. You didn't have that in Formosa, but these were the moral dilemmas and the strategic dilemmas that, that these folks had to grapple with uh, that we now come along later and, and, and you know, we have a better hindsight. But I also, you know, I look back and, and say, I don't know if I would have had to make those tough decisions. It was, it was a tough call either way. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Thanks, for, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, in your impression, in your re research, did you find that M MacArthur had some favoritism to any of his higher commanders, like, like Kruger or Eichelberger or, or anyone else that he, he had more faith in or that, mm. that he was partial? In your, in your impression? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because <laughs> uh, you remember how I said that Kruger and Eichelberger had this sort of rivalry? Um, and really, in a way, the, the antipathy and rivalry plays out among their staffers in, later on, you know, after both generals are dead in some ways, you know, later years. And both of them are going to argue, MacArthur preferred our guy, you know, and this is what shows it and all this. Well, MacArthur really deeply liked and respected both of them um, and was willing to put up with a lot from both of them. I think in terms of who he held in higher esteem as a, as a combat commander, I do think it was probably Eichelberger. But I think he was more personally comfortable with Kruger, and the reason is it was a better personality mix. Kruger had no wish to be a big uh, star, you know, like a like a media star uh, to be famous with the war. That, that wasn't what he was about. Eichelberger wanted that badly. Uh, Eichelberger's key classmate, one of his great friends, was George Patton, you know, who had become very famous by this point in the war. And Eichelberger kind of wanted that for himself. One of the things I found is that they corresponded a lot during World War II. 
and uh, it kept in, obviously kept in touch. And Eichelberger wasn't as ruthless as, as Hatton, of course, and as colorful. Um, I'll say that is the nicest word I can say. But, um, um, but he did want that military legacy. And I, so I think, I think MacArthur understood a great deal about both of these guys and, and used that to the betterment of SWAPA. Um, I understood that the Marines were uh, um, a small portion of the whole uh, GI um, populations in both theaters, mm -hmm. but I also, up till the, this point, thought that the both of them were involved in every landing, that the Marines were used like as the cutting edge to get a toehold on the beach, but then the Army came in large numbers. Mm -hmm. but. Apparently, some were just marine operations and some were just army operations. Well, it's the interesting thing is that there, there are very, very, very few strictly Marine Corps battles in this or any other war. Um, Tarawa would be one example I would give you. Iwo Jima, largely, although there's an army infantry regiment that fights there and some engineers and whatnot, but that's mainly a, a marine battle. Other than that, it's a team effort. Uh, Guadalcanal is a good example. It's associated with the Marines, but it's more so an army battle. So the, the pattern you mentioned does sometimes happen. Like at Guadalcanal, the Marines go in first. Bougainville, the Marines go in first. Um, you know, you, you do see this happen, and then you'll see larger army forces go and develop the, the fighting. But also, there's a lot of army-only vanguard operations, like Leyte being a really good example. Um, what a, the larger message I try to convey in this trilogy is that by and large, they're gonna fight shoulder to shoulder when they're together. And, they're, and, and I really do think that, it, and this is only my opinion, and this is just this is the fun of history that we can debate and maybe disagree or whatever, but I, I really do think that the whole, the supposed doctrinal differences have been overblown because when, at least in my research, when I look at how they actually fought, it's very similar. Uh, and they had, Marine and Army infantrymen had great respect for one another, largely. And, you know, they, they tended to fight in a very similar way very courageously. So, um, so I, I just think it's, um, I, I think it's a little unfortunate that there has been this view that uh, one fought one way and another fought the other way or whatever. I think that they, they had a lot more in common than otherwise, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, um, for coming. We really appreciate sure. that. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, my name is Rich Bork. I have a comment, a shameless plug, and a question. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm a volunteer at the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum in Reading. And the, re the reason the museum exists was to recover and restore a P-61 Blackbird, uh, <coughs> uh, Black Widow, that had crashed after taking off at Hollandia Army Airfield. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to the backstory of that, but that's really the reason that our museum exists. Um, the shameless plug is that this weekend is our 31st mm -hmm. Um, World War II weekend, which is the largest um, live uh, event in the world commemorating World War II. Uh, 1,500 reenactors, uh, 40 to 50 warbirds, all that sort of thing. I don't know if you've ever been there. I haven't. But if you're around, we'd love to have you <laughs> stop I, by. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but the question was kind of going back to what you were just talking about. Why is it in the public image is it that the Marines seem to be what people think of when they think of the Pacific Theater in World War II? Is it because of Hollywood? Is it, what, what do you think generated that perception? Yeah, I think that the, something of the media coverage of the time generates that perception a little bit um, it, because certain battles were associated strictly with the Marine Corps, typically like Guadalcanal would be a really good example I'd give you. And of course, as Guadalcanal is happening, Buna is happening. There are really two battles of the same campaign, especially from the Japanese point of view, and one of the reasons why the Japanese lose, they're spread too thin between the two battles. Um, I think that <laughs> MacArthur is a reason, because <laughs> MacArthur, let's be honest, sort of sucks the oxygen out of everything else and where, where he goes. And so there isn't a whole lot of ink and glory for his soldiers. Um, it's mainly MacArthur this, MacArthur that. And I think that's certainly, there's a, 
there's a perception that the, the army was lost in the Philippines in 1942, and that we had to then fight with whatever they had on hand, which was the Marines at that stage. And then, you know, not an appreciation of the longer sweep of the army building up the like as we've explored. Um, there's, um, I think in terms of popular memory through film, uh, is, is another really prime example. The miniseries The Pacific, which is, I think, outstanding on many levels. And one of the things I love about it is it, it brings much needed recognition to Robert Leckie, who is not only a, a Marine in World War II, but an incredible historian and author, uh, and a great influence for me. Uh, but also Eugene Sledge. So all that was the good side, but the bad side is it creates this sort of myopic idea that it was, well, Guadalcanal to Tarawa, to, uh, to basically uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and that was the Pacific War. Um, no, there, there's a lot more to it, and, because, and, and really the main way to understand uh, that, that the, the army is doing the vast majority of the fighting and dying in the Pacific is the Philippines. The Philippines are the nexus of the American war against Japan. Two major campaigns fought there. Uh, at least one third of our casualties suffered there, and all, almost all the POW casualties. Uh, so, the other factor too, the Marine Corps is really good at preserving its history, telling its story in a way because it has to be institutionally. It's smaller, uh, it's perceived as elite, and often in the crosshairs of Washington bureaucrats who say, why do we need two ground forces here? Why don't we just fold the Marine Corps into the Army? And of course, that's incredible heresy to any Marine, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, but, but the Truman administration was seriously thinking of doing this in the late 1940s. and. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the Marines push back against that and I think uh, they're, they're really good at preserving their history. I don't think the Army is quite as good at that because it doesn't necessarily need to be. Those are only my opinions, um, just perceptions, but I do think those are factors. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the war, MacArthur didn't have a good relationship with his Navy man, the guy mm -hmm. left, but he had a really good relationship with Halsey. Did he have a good relationship with Kincaid and other mm -hmm. Navy guys? Yeah, you're right, exactly. The, the uh, <coughs> Admiral, Admiral, I think it's Admiral Conley at the, the beginning of the war, interesting dynamic there. Um, the, the Admiral in command of what was called the U.S. Asiatic Fleet at the beginning of the war in 1941 and uh, 42. So it's a small, like, mainly surface and sub fleet uh, that it is a bit overmatched by the Imperial Japanese Navy at that stage and, and in MacArthur's perception doesn't do that much fighting. But the dynamic I alluded to is that this admiral had been a good friend of MacArthur's older brother. Uh, many of you may not know that MacArthur had an older brother who was a naval officer. Um, he, had a, he had a fine career ahead of him. Uh, he, I think he was either a full commander or he was a captain when he died of appendicitis of all things. Um, so this is so MacArthur obviously was the younger brother. And so this admiral knew <laughs> Douglas as just his buddy's kid brother. And, uh, and so it wasn't a very good dynamic there. And MacArthur, when he left the Philippines, felt that he had been betrayed by the Navy, felt that they had let him down, felt that they had been cowardly and all this kind of unfair thinking. Um, and then he meets Halsey. You know, and Halsey completely reshapes his definition of a naval commander. Their, their fathers had served together. Uh, Halsey is son of a naval officer and MacArthur obviously son of a general. Um, and they just meshed because Halsey was a very much a fighting officer and MacArthur liked and respected that and wanted that at that point. So MacArthur really comes a long way in his understanding of naval operations, especially on the amphibious side, uh, and understanding the Navy's vital role in everything that he's going to do. To his credit, MacArthur really evolves. So he forges excellent partnerships with Halsey at the sort of operational strike level, with Kincaid in terms of the, the amphibious level too, and also another kind of overlooked naval officer, uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Barbe who was a master at uh, the sort of troop level amphibious operations to the point where they called him Dan the Amphibious Man. Uh, so MacArthur had come a long way, and he'd come a long way, by the way, as long as we're on the topic of thinking of other services, in uh, aerial operations too, because uh, as you know, he had lost a lot of his air assets on the ground early on in the Philippines. He ends up blaming the, the air commanders for that and blaming Lieutenant General George Brett, who had commanded everything that was left in Australia. Uh, and saying, oh, you know, the, the Army Air Forces stink, they may not help us, and it's this, that, and the other thing. Well, then Kenny comes along. And MacArthur's partnership with Kenny is arguably one of the most successful partnerships ever in military history. And certainly from an aviator's point of view, uh, it's right up there. Uh, great, great question. Others? 
Hello, the fellow from uh, Reading, World War II weekend. I pushed for him to come. <laughs> He's on a very, very busy schedule. We also have a, you know, we should start these meetings at the cell. And I'd say, do we have any World War II veterans? Mm -hmm. And we used to get like 30 or 40 hands. So here's where we are today. We're keeping the story going at a different level. Well, I, John, you met this fellow over here. Yeah. You're talking about um, you were talking about the money, or we do this and everything else. We have a we have a veteran here that was actually in Late Take Off. His name is Chuck Klein, and we got together. I brought John in. John's talked for us four times now, so we're very proud to have him on our side. But he came in the last time. I said, I want you to meet a veteran. And we went to Chuck's house and met Ruth. And these two couldn't stop talking for about an hour. <laughs> and there's, they had pictures there. And, this, and he said, no, no, no. That's MacArthur's ship back there. This is, he knew the ships there, you know, from that. And uh, you and... Uh, John has built a good relationship, so let me say thank you for your service. Sir. Thank you, Chuck Appreciate Klein. It. Yeah. We have a um, helmet committee. They stand at the door. They're armed. <laughs> so if you want to get out, consider giving them something. John, this is your fourth time here, and I hope we have four more. Hope it's so every time you just told the story in ways that, that people just don't don't get to hear it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks. You want to come down and meet people? I think some people want to meet you personally. And here's your buddy over here. <laughs>